Hello and welcome to Written in Uncertainty, a YouTube channel situated firmly in the grey maybe of the series universe. My name is Aramithius and today I'm kicking off a series of close textual readings of some of the Elder Scrolls texts that we find within the games and having a look at how they all fit in together, what they're saying, how they, um, how they relate to each other and the broader concepts and metaphysics that the series we find within the series. So I've had a request that I start off with Children of the Root, which we find in Merkmire in the Elder Scrolls Online. So without any further ado, let's kick off. It starts off with a note saying that it's collected by researcher Solus Aduro from an oral tradition of the Adzi Kostlil tribe and not otherwise attested. Now that means that this is a single set of tr oral traditions that are being looked at, collected by a single scholar running around bugging a tribe of Argonians for a while. So it's not representative of all Argonians, it's not likely to be a full representation of what they believe because this particular scholar may have missed something, so with the caveat that it may be entirely wrong in its way, let's get started. There was first only Attack, the Great Root. It knew nothing but itself, so it decided to be everything. It grew and grew, trying to fill the nothing with itself. As it grew, it formed new roots, and those roots took names, and they wanted space of their own to grow. Now this feels very like the Red Guard creation myth, with Sutter the world serpent, who carries on growing and needs to eat itself in order to grow. And so we get the sense straight away that this isn't going to be a normal creation myth as such, at least not in relation to how the basic terms of what the entities are are called. So we're going to have to do a bit of mapping in terms of what entity is what if we're going to start to make sense of it based on what most other races talk about on Tamriel. I think the best starting point for this is to consider Attack something like Anu, who's also called Anu the Everything in, I think, the Monomyth. So that's a reasonable starting point, uh, although the roots here are kind of interesting. The way that the new roots take on names and want space of their own feels like something that should happen further down the creation story, so to speak. This isn't something that any other culture really puts at the level of Anu or Anu and Padme. So we've got some big differences in how the world is seen and quite what the roots are is something that I have my own answer for that we will get to, but it's a little inconsistent in how they're used, so we'll have to think about some possibly different answers for that. If we're thinking about roots that are formed now, it's likely that the roots are some sort of spirit or something that exists beyond this Arabis. Then Attack learned that there were things other than itself. They were just like Attack, but went a different way from it. They saw and made strange new things that did not last, except in how it changed them. I think this is potentially a nod towards the formlessness and changelessness of the pre-Mundus Arabis, that you've got things that will be created and not last and just will go on that way, that you've got spirits that are constantly in, f in flux maybe, but nothing ever really lasting beyond the spirits themselves. Attack continued to grow until something came back from the nothing. It was like a root, but it had scales and eyes and a mouth. It told Attack that it was called Kota, and it had been growing too. Now that it had a mouth, it was hungry. And here we get more parallels with the Red Guard creation myth. When you look at how the Red Guards phrase it, they talk about Satak 
and akel, and akel being the hungry stomach, which is very close to what's being talked about here, and Ata and akel being the nothing, the emptiness, is something that we'll see um, some of the thematics crop up with about akel as well. Um, it also was worth noting that it came from the nothing, which, apart from sounding like it is something to do with a never-ending story, um, it's important that you've got Attack being something and Kota being nothing, and how that, that interplay plays out. We've got our reasonably standard Anu Padme duality starting to form here. Attack named Kota for what it was, Serpent. It put roots through the serpent's eyes, but Kota was old and strong like the root, and had grown fangs while it was away. It bit Attack. They coiled round each other. From their struggle, new things came to be. Attack learned things Kota had learned, including hunger, and so it bit Kota back. They ate and roiled for so long that they became one and forgot their conflict. Now that is starting to sound a bit like the Anu Padme interplay that you see in the Anuad, which creates the Arabis. You see two primordial beings coming together and their oppositeness and their interplay creating a space for something else to happen. Although it's not quite as adversarial as the Anuad puts it. Um, it's much as they talk about biting and rolling. It's for me looks like it's something else as well. Physically from, from the struggle, new things came to be. Rolling around and fighting isn't usually how new beings come about. And so you're talking about a series of beings that are that are fighting, are opposing each other, and also breeding all in that same, same instant. That's how I read that. And they're also rubbing off on each other. So you've got Attack learning hunger from Kota, and presumably Kota learning a few things from Attack as well, as the, these ideas mixing together, which I think is important in how we think about one of the figures that's going to come up later in this particular text. Um, but that it sounds very like the way that the Argonians see the creation of the Arabis, so to speak, or at least at this stage. And they shed their skin and severed their roots and called themselves Atakota, who said, maybe, and there's your confirmation. They become this one thing which says maybe, grey maybe, the Arabis. And when Atakota said this, the skin it has shed knew itself. It ate the severed roots, and even though it was dead, it followed Atakota like a shadow. Now the shadow is the important figure here. It's the uh, it's the shadow of Kota. It's the representation of nothingness expressed in another way. So we've potentially got something that is saying that this is Adam and Padme, this is a new El and Scythius and Scythus on the next level down. So you've got that particular cycle and you've also got this shedding of the skin and eating and so on, which is similar to the Red Guards Calpic cycle and the way they understand the way that Satak eats things and then sheds its skin and then those skins become the world skins. And so if we go back to the text for a second, Atakota continued to roil and each of its scales was a world that it devoured. But now Atakota was not in conflict and things had time to begin and end. The shadow wished it could eat these things, but its belly was full of roots that were growing. Now we have the comparisons with the Red Guard myth there fairly obviously, but you've also got the shadow wanting to eat stuff, the shadow wanting to consume as well, but it's full of roots. Now quite what the roots are isn't clear at this stage, 
but it's obviously becoming attached to something and we see earlier in the text the roots are things that have a purpose and to an extent a will because they've already got names and they want space of their own so the shadow has taken on some of the bits of attack that came that came earlier so it's not quite as nihilistic as it was as it was before maybe um, but you've also got the idea that things now have time to begin and end but thing and things have time full stop um, this is again mirrored in the red guard creation myth where um, after after Satakal has eaten certain things, they can then stop and create and be something else. And we'll get into talk now about the about the roots and how they interact a bit later. When the shadow could bear it no longer, it swam closer to Atakota and spat out the roots. Now that its belly was empty, the shadow almost ate them again and everything else it saw. But it had come to see the roots as its own after carrying them. So instead, it told them its secrets and went to sleep. So now we have the shadow telling its children, if you like, its purpose, it, what it wants, um, and everything, everything that it knows. You have... A primordial shadow passing or passing on its secrets and potentially continuing the cycle but it's continuing the cycle in a different way it's movement beyond what it was before because otherwise it would just be eat them again be be full and then spat out, spit out the roots again and then get hungry eat them again but no there's some development here some of oh sorry um, the roots found others and told them how they had survived in the belly of the shadow and how they were ab still able to grow there when they shared this knowledge with the others it changed them and they took on new forms with new names I think what we're seeing here is a um, is the beginning of the beginning of the process that is called subgradients in the Elder Scrolls, that you're seeing the gods as they are start or the Adra starting to begin the process of understanding themselves within the monomyth. Anu creates a Nuiel, um, which is the soul of its soul, in order to understand itself, in order to be able to introspect. And so we have knowledge here that is changing them. And but if we think about how the monomyth puts it, then then the beings needed to change to get knowledge. So and then you've also got the new forms and the new names, so which again makes me think this is subgradients. This is the beginning of that process. Although quite how the survival in the belly of the shadow works, I'm not totally sure because you've also got the um, the process of the Arabis already, which feels like that should have come before, if you get what I mean. Some of these spirits wanted to keep the names and forms they had chosen, but they had learned them through the shadow, and now it was now in all of them, making them temporary. They learned of hunger and conflict, and they learned to fear change, and called it death. Until this point, we've not seen any sort of judgement about whether something is good or bad or indifferent in the process, it just, it just has been. Um, that the skins have been being shed, things have been being eaten and appearing and vomiting things up and the like. But that's all fine. That's part of the natural order, potentially. Um, now we have beings that fear change and that kind of becomes normative, if you like. It, be, it gets called death. But if you remember earlier, we have had beings dying before um, the 
skin that has shed itself that became the shadow was already dead but that's not death so we have a very very different way of looking at things here that these beings knowing of hunger and conflict um, have learned to fear change um, and so you've got the idea that change can be bad which is the first time this happens in the narrative and these spirits were angry and afraid but the roots showed the spirits ways between places from when attack had made paths out of nothing they could use these river ways to hide from death and again this is something that makes me think is this half written by a red guard or something because this is very, very obviously um, something that helps spirits persist um, and can carry on, which is also a big thing in Redguard mythology. The way that some of the um, some of the spirits look for a place to exist between world skins in Redguard mythology, and so that the technique for moving between the world skins becomes a place called the Far Shores sounds very, very similar to this. And it also means that the Argonians are a culture that acknowledge Kalpas and acknowledge world cycles in a much more explicit way than most of the other cultures on Tamriel. The Red Guards, until now, have been oddballs in that they've recognised that cycle in a way that other cultures haven't, but now the Argonians have joined them in thinking about time and the universe as a cyclical thing and something that means death and change and is then something to move beyond potentially. The spirits were content and set about to make things that looked like them and shared in their aspects and loved them. They kept growing until they were as big as Atakota, and they forgot it came before him, before them, sorry, and that it had a shadow that was sleeping. Now this makes me think that this is when the spirits start to get settled within Mundus, within the place where they are so they start making their own existence making their own path cutting themselves off from their past and car and carrying on in time the worlds were too worlds plural were too big and there was no more room again the spirits went to the roots to ask for more but the roots had gone to sleep content with what they had made because it changed so often that it did not need to grow now this is an interesting one um, cuz first of all we have things getting inflated again and then running at, running running out of room and quite what that means for the structure of the world we'll see in the next paragraph but um, then we've got the contrast with of growth and change because it talks about something changing so often that it did not need to grow it's the best metaphor I can think of of how to put this is that you have a certain amount um, have a certain amount of activity going on within a within a body of water so and but you have a certain so long as you have a certain amount of current in water you don't need any more water that's kind of garbled i'm i'm sorry i can't think of another way to put it but it's the idea that so long as you have a certain amount of change then you don't need progress anymore which I think has huge implications for how the Argonians are it's something that I've seen as leveled almost as an accusation against the Argonians is that if they like change so much if they like Sithis so much why do they never change but they do change constantly it's just that the way that we as humans think about change change for us means growth and change is only good in so far as it promotes growth whereas 
this is pretty much the opposite way around. Growth is only good insofar as it promotes change. Then things start to get too big if you start to um, to not need it to produce change anymore, which is in very direct conflict with how we as humans and most of the Elder Scrolls universe understands change. Most explicitly, the Sijix, when you look at the way the old ways pre presents change in that book, and um, change is a neutral force. It's it's something that is good in some places, bad in others. And so the Sijix are encouraged to promote change when it's good and denounce it when it's bad. But to an Argonian, change is the good thing. So it's kind of a totally opposite way of looking at um, at the way the world works compared to most other races. But I think we probably need to get back to the text now. I think I've repeated myself enough. The spirits grew so desperate and hungry that they tore at Atakota's skin and drank its blood. They ate until they broke Atakota so that Atak remembered growing and Kota remembered being nothing. There was conflict again, and from the spirits, Atak and Kota learned about death, so there was violence, blood, and sap. If we're talking about Atak and Kota and Anu and Padme springing apart again, this almost feels like the spirits growing so desperate they ended the world. They not exactly turned the clock back, but ended the world, ended the Kalpa, um, which is a cycle of the world in the Elder Scrolls, from creation to destruction, and there are multiple of these. So that feels like a turn of the Kalpa, that the spirits get hungry and, in essence, destroy the world. It's different, again, from Nordic culture, where Alduin is the world eater and the harbinger of death, whereas this says that all the spirits do it, that um, that everyone is responsible, which is a really interesting perspective. It doesn't try and split good, bad, Aedra, Daedra, Anuic, Padmaic, or anything. It's just, this is the spirits, and this is what they are, and this is what happens. In the chaos, the spirits were lost and afraid, so they ate others and themselves. They drank of blood and sap, and they grew scales and fangs and wings. And these spirits forgot, forgot why they had made anything other than to eat it. There were other spirits that still clung to what they were and what they had made. A forest spirit came and saw that the roots loved their children like she loved hers, so she taught them to walk and talk. They told her secrets with new words, and she sang the song back to them. The roots woke up when they heard this and joined with the forest. Now remember, the roots had been sleeping. The roots had been, been being kept in the shadow or with the shadow, separate from all this goings on. And then all of a sudden they join the forest. I, th I think this is the point where the hist become the hist. That they wake up, they look on the world, and they become something new. And they become something foresty. Because it's also um, important that this is children of the root, and the Argonians call themselves the people of the root, not the people of the trees. Hit people talk about the hist as being the trees, but I think the root is the more important thing, and that explains why we've been having the talk about the root all the way through this. But exactly what the forest spirit is, I don't know. The most obvious candidate is Ifri. Um, being associated with the green and so on and so forth. But I think what the most likely candidate, given what this is, there's an impartation of secrets and knowledge, which is the domain of Hermaeus Mora. And if you look at Nordic myth, Herman Mora is called the Woodland Man. So we've not only got the roots being associated with the shadow and Sithis, we've also potentially got a connection here with Hermaeus Mora being taught, th um, teaching them things. Um, 
The roots saw that Kota's blood had made oceans, and Atak's sap had made stones, and each of these spirits had never known the shadow. I want to stop there for a second because it's implying that oceans and stones are spirits. That's a very direct reference to the earth bones as spirits, as things, and that we have the etada which become part of the world and part of the Adra. But we've already had a few cycles of creation and destruction, so is this something that's different from how the previous worlds were constituted? I don't honestly know. Um, but let's carry on. Um, the roots knew what this would mean and asked the shadow to protect its children. And not having known the shadow means that you will get death again, you'll get violence again, you'll get blood and sap again, um, which means that the, you'll, you'll get things dying again, which um, means that the Root's children, um, who it's, it's attached to, it's attached to, remember, and the shadow is attached to the Root's, thanks to them all dwelling together, um, means that they need this protection. Um, which also implies that the Hist are extra Kalpic, that they've seen what's gone on before, which we also see in Tales of the Fabled Explorer, or Tales of the Famous Explorer, something like that, where um, the Shadow and the Roots make towers secure, and towers are the secret shape of the Arabis. So we've seen shadows and roots club together to keep previous worlds safe. And so I think a similar thing is going on here, that the roots are again petitioning Sithis, petitioning the shadow in order to protect the Argonians to keep what they have and is definitely theirs safe. The shadow woke it looked up, it looked upon Kota and Atak and saw how different the nothing had become and how it was becoming the same it was as before. It remembered it was the skin of Atakota and it was bigger than Kota or Atak alone, so it decided it would eat them both. And this is potentially why we see Sithis being such a big and imposing figure within the Elder Scrolls. Uh, they are associated with entropy and destruction and with consuming everything because it's something that is simply going to repeat a cycle unless the shadow does something um, which is also which is both the same and different as before if you become different from the union of Atakota, then you forget everything and then the cycle begins again and you have violence, blood and sap. So the shadow feels like it's trying to stop that. It's trying to eat everything and keep everything safe within itself because of course it's had the roots in there and they've been fine. So if the, if the shadow can just eat everything, everything will be fine. And it did. The shadow ate the snake and the root, and the sap and the stone, and the oceans of blood, and all the spirits. It had eaten everything before it remembered the roots that were its children, so it looked unto itself to find them. When the shadow saw this, it remembered that it was a skin of something that came before, and it had eaten what came after, and this would be an end that what always was. And so we see again cycles coming up that we get a sense that this is potentially not the first time the shadow has decided to eat everything. That it suddenly realises, oh, this is some big moment of culmination of everything and this is what I am and so I need to do something else. And it, because it splits itself off, because everything then comes out of it and has to subgradiate, has to 
be something different in order to understand itself. It can never reach a total understanding. And so you will always have this cycle of everything eating everything else and trying to gain that knowledge, which also has some really interesting implications for the Tsaisi creation myth, which is they we ate it to become it, if you go along with that particular text, which is expressing very much the same idea that to consume something utterly is to understand it and to and to learn all the lessons that it can give you, which is why you have um, Attack and Kota at the start merging together and then learning and eating. Um, and then when you need to eat again, you need to understand more. Um, but if you only have a certain amount of material to start with, you need to have lost it first, I think is the underlying logic here, that um, that it creates that cycle of, oh, this is everything, oh no, I need to do something, I can't do anything, I need to get rid of everything. And finally we have the line, and so the shadow shed its skin, even though that was all it was, and it fell like a shroud over the roots, promising to keep them safe within its secrets. Which is a very, very outright statement of the hist and sithis in a um, in a relationship looking to for the one to look out for the other but it also feels like the cycle is beginning again that the sh um, that the shadow is taking the roots into itself again in a different way and protecting it again and then the roots will want to create children again and so the cycle begins fresh, but I don't think that there's a definite starting point to all this, having wound our way all the way through it. I've said all the way through, it's really difficult to work out what's what if you're trying to put a definite analogy and time scale onto it and fit it to a single narrative. I think what this book is actually trying to do is tell the tale of several different iterations of the Arabis having gone round several times. And so each time the shadow is something slightly different, Atakota is something slightly different, and that's kind of how it moves forward in a, in a sense, if it moves at all. And I think that's probably about all I can bring out of it at this point uh, without going into various other bits and pieces of the Elder Scrolls lore and bringing in other texts that I want to go through and give the full treatment themselves. I do hope you've enjoyed us looking through this uh, this text in this close reading. Please, if you have any other comments and any thoughts of this your own, please put something down in the comments and I really look forward to hearing your opinions and I do hope you join me next time for um, the next text I'm going to read, but until then, this video remains a letter written in uncertainty. You've been listening to Written in Uncertainty, a podcast written and presented by Aramithius. The music for this podcast has been kindly provided by Jan Glimbotsky. Check them out on SoundCloud under Songs from the Lost Land, and I'll see you next.